Hello and welcome to my presentation today at Apply and Innovate. My title of my presentation today is Real Database Validation of Highly Automated Driving Functions Using Simulation Methods. My name is Raphael Pfeffer. I'm a research assistant and PhD candidate at KIT, Karlsruhe Institute of Technology. Okay, let's get started. First, let's have a look on the agenda of today's presentation. I will start with a short motivation for the topic before jumping into the explanation of the so-called real-world random testing dilemma. And uh, here, by the way, you will also learn what the testing of autonomous driving functions has actually in common with the soccer world championship. After that, I will present a new approach, simulation-based validation using real data scenarios as a potential solution concept for this dilemma. We will then take a deeper look into the parts of this concept. Finally, I will present individual results from the evaluation of this new concept before I will come to a short conclusion and a summary. Let us start with having a look at the challenges from a testing and validation point of view for automated and autonomous driving. Um, according to the model shown here, we can split the task in three different areas. First of all, we have the so-called known knowns, which is a testing space where we are sure about the requirements, where the specifications are all available and where we are therefore sure about solutions derived from these requirements and specifications. Um, this applies basically to all conventional advanced driving assistance systems because the human driver always has to serve as a fallback. In a second stage, we have the known unknowns. In this testing, uh, space requirements and specifications are partly available, at least in a way that we are able to think of these and therefore can always derive possible solutions. The problem actually with automated driving functions is that for many cases in our test space, requirements and specifications are not available, the unknown unknowns, and as a consequence, solutions are undefined. We have a so-called open world problem. Um, another way to describe the problem is the combinatorial test case explosion we are facing. Here is just a simple example leading to huge numbers of test cases. If we think of a very simple overtaking situation of an ego vehicle and another agent vehicle, we can easily find three different parameters like start distance between the vehicle, the star starting speed of our ego vehicle and the starting speed of the other vehicle, the agent. If we define a certain parameter space for these and combine these parameters combinatorically, we get over 7600 variations, just for different starting scenes of that overtaking maneuver. On the other hand, there are a lot more parameters which affect our function under test. If we just assume three characteristics for each of these parameters, we get over 6,000 variations um, just for these. In combination with the before mentioned 7,600 variations, we have a total of nearly 50 million variations for a simple overtaking maneuver. Okay, let's assume for a while these 50 million variants of scenarios would cover the complete testing space. Then, this would lead us to the question, how many scenarios would then actually have to be driven in real world to cover this test space for sure? The underlying problem is basically the same as with the pictures of soccer players that can be bought and collected randomly at the World Championships. In German, it's the Panini Sammelheft. The first picture you buy there is always new with a probability of one. But with each additional picture, the probability that the picture already exists increases. The last missing picture or scenario is very hard to find. From a mathematical point of view, that is described as a so-called coupon collector's problem. The expectation value to complete a set of n scenarios is calculated by the nth partial sum of the harmonic series multiplied by n or can be approximized using this expression here with the Euler-Mascheroni constant. 
For our searched 50 million scenarios, we need, as expected, a little more than 900 million scenarios to be driven. Sounds actually not too bad, right? But the problem is our scenarios are not equally distributed. And this is unlike the case of soccer player images in the standard coupon collectors problems, or at least the sellers of those pictures claim it would be so. Not equally distributed means that there are some scenarios to be found with a higher probability than others. I think this is intuitively clear when you think of typical situations in everyday uh, road traffic. Uh, one way to consider this is given by the ZIPF distribution. Many natural processes follow uh, the ZIPF dis distribution like the dis distribution of city sizes in a country. The distribution says basically if the elements of a set, for example the words of a text as shown here, are ordered by their frequency, the probability p of their occurrence is inversely proportional to the position n within the ranking. That means, for example, the most frequently used word in a text, the, occurs on average approximately twice as often as the word of. Applying the coupon collector's problem to our scenario problem, assuming this ZIF distribution for our scenarios means we now need approximately 16 billion scenarios to be driven for our 50 million as expected. 16 billion needed scenarios sounds not so good anymore, I guess. And furthermore, the expectation where you must not be considered for a safety evaluation as it only says says that this is a value to be reached on average if this kind of experiment would be repeated many, many times. If we need a more, let's say, reliable statement of about 99.9% .9 probability to reach this result, we would need about 20 billion scenarios to find our 50 million. And I think needless to say, a 100% cannot ever be reached with a random testing approach. So long story short, in reality we see that there is a big difference in the verification validation task between automated driving and conventional ADAS. In an open world we have this previously explained random testing dilemma. On the other hand, a full test coverage using simulation or lab methods only, as mentioned in the beginning, is also not possible. But if we would use fleet vehicles instead of prototype vehicles with a comparable sensor configuration, we could efficiently collect the large number of required scenarios and, for the same reasons as mentioned before, a statistical certainty about the minimum diversity of the scenarios. So the key question I worked on is, how can relevant scenarios and test cases be derived by reference system, that means a lot of data recordings, and be represented efficiently? That leads to the following concept. We need a huge source for data recordings, for example using fleet vehicles. Use it to extract the scenarios from the data by applying different concepts and techniques. Collect and manage them in catalogs, which are the basis for the test cases. Preferably, these test cases can be performed using conventional test methods like um, X-in-the-loop testing. In a verification step, the new data generated in the X-in-the-loop test is compared against the original data from the recordings. At this point, I already talked a lot about scenarios. Let us have a look at two questions. What actually are these scenarios from a state of the art testing approach point of view? How can it be applied to be previously explained to the previously explained concept? Briefly explained, a scenario can be seen as a sequence of scenes which contain um, sceneries with static elements like the road, traffic signs and so on. Dynamic elements such as vehicles, pedestrians, etc. And the self-representation of the subject under test. Actions and events describe the transitions between these scenes while goals and values define our testing target. Applied to the concept, it is necessary to identify the different elements in our underlying data set and transform them into an appropriate description format. For many parts, there 
already exist methods and formats like HD maps or the standards open drive and open scenario or the IPG formats test run and road five. I'd like to focus here on the action parts of a scenario because this is something um, which currently still raises many unanswered questions. Action in a scenario context can be described as maneuvers of each agent. And if we have a look at the state of the art definitions in research and literature, we see that there are many differences describing maneuvers depending on the respective use cases. This is just a small overview of some examples. Unfortunately, it's in German, but nevertheless, the main message here is that there are many maneuver definitions, sometimes matching, but often they are not and often on very different abstraction levels. To be applicable to the concept here, we need a reduction to an appropriate abstraction level for all dynamic objects for the maneuver definition. This is needed to enable a representation of a complete space of possible scenarios and to establish distance measures between scenarios, which is a requirement for a way of a later clustering of um, all resulting scenarios. In my work, we defined three kinds of maneuvers, depending on their abstraction level. First, we have so-called atomic maneuvers, which have the lowest abstraction level and therefore the highest degree of accuracy, which basically allows the descriptions of as many phenomena in detail as possible. There are basic actions of longitudinal and lateral control of a human driver or an automated system, such as steering wheel or pedal input. On a second level, we have the so-called basic maneuvers, which can be seen as basic units for a specific application environment. At the use case of a highway pilot, there are, for example, lane keeping, lane changing maneuvers or in um, longitudinal direction, the increase or reduction of a target speed. On the highest abstraction level, we have the so-called composite maneuvers, which are basically combinations of basic maneuvers like overtaking and um, can also describe relations between different agents of a scenario. My work and the following is based on the concept of basic maneuvers. So, how can this fit into the concept or how could we adapt a scenario meta model which takes this into account? A scenario is defined as a sequence of states and actions. For the actions, we need a model based on the description of basic maneuvers. So let us stay with the example of a highway en environment. Here we have six basic maneuvers three in longitudinal and three in lateral direction, as mentioned before, for each the ego vehicle and each agent or dynamic object. In the past, many researchers have worked on modeling driving maneuvers. Based on polynomial models, the description is implemented using representative characteristics. The corresponding quantities, such as start and um, end velocities of a maneuver, are aggregated in a vector. Different actions or maneuvers in a scenario might lead to different states. States in a scenario context are more or less static scenes, or we could also say snapshots in time. Here a simple grid-based state model is used. A scene or state as an abstract representation of the relationship between ego vehicle and an object i at the time t is described in a two-tuple considering the longitudinal and lateral position in a virtual grid of an object relatively to our ego vehicle. Combining the action and the state model, we can represent the elements using a tensor, which is basically built of time-based matrices describing the development of the scenario for each object from an ego vehicle's perspective. For each point in time where a state or maneuver transition is detected, all characteristics are extracted and saved in this tensor. The advantage is we can use a single tensor as representation of all objects, regardless of the time length of the actual data recording. 
The length of the tensor in the time dimension represents all contained scenarios but is independent of the length of the particular scenarios. So why is that an advantage? A scenario can contain a lot of sub-scenarios. For example, a scenario overtaking contains the sub-scenario shear out and additional sub-scenarios. But independent of the actual time length of an overtaking scenario, which of course can vary, the representation in the tensor always has the same length. This allows to identify same or similar scenarios at a later stage. To sum it up, we have a flexible scenario meter model using this tensor approach, which can be easily extended by further information using additional dimensions. This could also be information about the scenery context of a scenario or some additional information about the static environment. A cut along the time dimension allows to access all included sub-scenarios. The depth of the tensor adapts dynamically to the number of objects in the data set or the parts of a sub-scenario. This representation is very suitable for post-processing steps like filtering or clustering. It can be also transferred to other scenario descriptions such as open scenario or CarMaker test run format. And in general, it is a very memory efficient format compared to the raw data of a recording. Let us now have a look at how can this new scenario meta model perform when using it in the context of our concept. In the first step, we have to think about the extraction of the tensor information out of the recorded data. One important task is to detect the basic maneuvers of all objects in the right way. Um, for this purpose, we can use several approaches like methods for time series analysis, for example, dynamic time warping or, for example, artificial neural networks. These algorithms need a lot of training data, so in order to design and develop these networks, it is an efficient idea to first generate data using a simulation engine. That enables us to get data in a more or less unlimited quantity while we also get all the ground truth information. For this issue, we generated randomized scenarios on highways using CarMaker with um, different agents and tons of different lane change and overtaking maneuvers. Um, this way, several thousand kilometers were generated and used as input for the training of our artificial neural network. Um, here's shown which tools uh, were used for the entire workflow in my work. Next, I will give a short insight in the maneuver extraction task and uh, show you some results. Maneuver extraction as part of the scenarios using artificial neural networks requires first to design appropriate network architectures with a lot of hyperparameters. To find out which architectures and hyperparameters combinations fits best to our problem here, we investigated different variants in a master thesis last year. The target was to design a matching neural network, which is able to detect lateral maneuvers of um, surrounding objects out of the ego vehicles recorded data. And obviously the output of this network is the result of the maneuver classification. So in this case, always the three different lateral maneuvers. But on the other hand, the input is, in the, is dependent on the available signals we recorded with our ego vehicle related to the objects. So here we varied architectures which dealt with um, five to 10 signals as inputs. And inputs are such as relative velocity, relative angles, and so on. Um, for the hidden layers, we designed different combinations of LSTMs, which are long short-term memory layers. Um, I will not explain at this point. At the end, we could show that the networks perform pretty when two to three hidden layers were used. We achieved an overall classification accuracy of more than 95% when having 9 to 10 input signals. If just 5 signals were available, we achieved about 2 percentage points less in accuracy. But to evaluate the entire concept, the big question is now how well does the X and loop test represent the original data? So the real data. 
Only if this is the case, this methodology can be applied to the key question as showed um, in the beginning. There are several possibilities for verification as shown here. Um, a very simple verification step could be to perform a plausibility and consistency uh, check on the tensor values. Another verification step can be done directly um, on the abstraction level of the tensor itself. After extraction of the scenarios, its tensor generation and the closed loop x in the loop test out of the tensor, we can generate the tensor representation out of the new data generated um, by the x in the loop test. If we once again generate the tensor representation, we can compare these tensors. And um, last but not least, we can compare the data generated by our x in the loop uh, test on a signal level with the original recording data, which basically shows um, how the generated data somehow matches with our record data. Um, for this reason, as a statistical measure, is used the mean absolute percentage error for six different characteristics related to the ego vehicle and the average object behavior. For example, velocity ego, velocity object, describes the average deviation in the velocity of the ego vehicle, respectively the objects, over time between the original data set and the X in the loop resimulation. Applied to the generated simulation data, as mentioned before, here you can see the results. As you can see, the X in the loop results match the generated data pretty good, as the error for all characteristics is in an error of, let's say, 0.5%. The um, errors describing the longitudinal behavior are even a little lower, as you can see here. Let us finally have a look how the concept works if instead the randomly uh, simulated data input, real data is used, as that is basically the intended use case. Therefore, we use two different available data sets. One is the HID data set, which contains more than uh, 16 hours of recording of drone data from German highways. The advantage is this data set is pretty large and directly provides all object information and trajectories. The other data set is the so-called lift data set, which is actually based on recordings um, of typical car sensors like uh, LiDAR or camera, as the extraction of object data out of sensor raw data would be far beyond the scope of this presentation. I will here show some results of HiD data set only. So on the left hand side, you see a visualization of an example data trace of HiD data set. In the first step, we transferred all trajectories in a simple replay simulation in CarMaker without using any models for ego vehicle or any object. You see the corresponding top view of the same sample in CarMaker on the right hand side compared to the input data of HiD on the left hand side. Afterwards, we created sensor data from an ego vehicle perspective of each object and generated in this way about 20,000 kilometers of recordings in about 100,000 sequences. Out of about 500 randomly selected sequences of these, I applied the presented process by first extracting the tensor representation and out of that generating the X in the loop simulations. When the same matrix I introduced you to before um, is used for these 500 sequences, we actually get uh, similar good results for our six parameters as before. In fact, the lateral parameters are even slightly better than in the synthetic input data case. You see that here. Um, the reason is pretty simple and can be simply explained by the much lower relative relative number of dynamic lateral maneuvers in the real data compared to our synthetically generated data. Last but not least, let me summarize my presentation. Test and validation for functions higher than level two require new methods. I introduced you to a scenario-based test approach, which combines conventional X and loop testing with a scenario and test case derivation from recorded data. The concept is based on a new scenario meta model, 
the results show a very good capability using this scenario meta model with regards to um, a closed loop simulation performance. That brings me to the end of my presentation. Thank you all for watching and goodbye.